Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, State. Um, I'd like to just be able to share with you um, a re-representation of what we've heard over the last week. And um, I'd like to start with just um, helping you understand from the details that were given um, and consider that the condition of both myself and Mrs. Matthewson um, were not adequate enough to truly paint a picture that you could understand. Um, if you recall, we spent a lot of time that weekend just talking, just trying to figure things out, wrestling around, fighting about a variety of issues. Some of them you heard about, some of them you haven't. Um, but you do remember that we didn't sleep very much. Uh, our emotions were all over the place. Uh, our stress was high. You've heard these things through her testimony and through uh, statements of others in this, in this case. And so I ask you to please keep that in mind as you look through as I walk you through uh, the facts that were presented. I, I first ask you to pay attention to the photographs. As you walk through the photographs, I ask you to please look through them and notice um, things in the residence of Mrs. Matheson, um, that there were no signs of a struggle, uh, that there was not broken glass or dents in walls, uh, there's not scratches on uh, countertops or blood splatter. Uh, this was not a, uh, a scene that depicted some kind of crime or some kind of uh, anything more than what she described as wrestling around. And I also ask you to look and see that the things aren't thrown about as she described. Things are where they're supposed to be. Um, you can see that uh, we packed, we left, and we had a, a plan to go to my house. Uh, her accusation is that uh, she was tied to go to my house. But I ask you, does it make sense to go meet children with a woman tied up? I also ask you to look at um, the items that were uh, disturbed by law enforcement uh, during their uh, three times investigating that home. Um, there are a number of things, uh, statements that were made, uh, including a variety of articles within the home um, that weren't brought in front of you so that you can't make conclusions, so that you can't corroborate the stories or the statements that were made here. I ask, you, I ask you to look through the pictures of the vehicle. I ask you to consider um, that they don't line up with her story as either. Um, little things like the pancake platter sitting in the second row and not the third. Uh, little things like a purse being full of all kinds of contents uh, that were helpful to her, useful to her, that she didn't really need if the whole intent to take her somewhere uh, and kidnap her or steal her car, why would she need her purse? Why would she need her phone? Why would she need her charger? It doesn't make any sense. And I also ask you to look at the car handle. The car handle's far up in the front of the door. And her <coughs> statement is her hands are tied behind her back. I think most of us understand that if you lean your back against the car door and you pull the handle, you're going to fall out. You're going to tumble on your head. But she didn't say that happened. I also ask you to look at the pictures of Mrs. Matthewson. You'll see the full pictures when she was evaluated and examined after uh, these events. Um, you'll see that the bruises line up with wrestling around. You'll also see marks, uh, bruises on her arms where she said, I lifted her up through a ravine. And you'll see exactly that's true. We pulled her up through a ravine. Um, you'll see that there are blisters on her heels. Uh, again, I mentioned to you guys, uh, or I questioned um, her about why she didn't put flip-flops on, uh, why she would put shoes back on if she already had marks on her heels. And her answer was not responsive. And so... Objection, Judge. Inappropriate misstatement of the facts. Hold on. Uh, well, I'll instruct the jury at this time that what Mr. Summers says during closing and the attorneys during their closing <coughs> is not evidence in the case. I will instruct you to rely on your own recollection of what the testimony and evidence was. Generally, if you remember, we walked through those fields for hours in muddy conditions. Those shoes, as Ms. Matthewson testified, were getting stuck in the mud, and clearly that's what caused the uh, blisters on her heels. You won't see um, any kind of rope burns on her wrists or her ankles. They're not there. 
You also won't find any photographs of anything after that. Um, the, the law enforcement failed to investigate anything further beyond uh, Ms. Matthewson's condition to see if another bruise would show up on the other side of her neck or if any bruises or, or marks would show up anywhere else. That would have probably been a, a normal thing to do. Um, and you'll also see that we physically fought each other. I don't argue that with you. And I also ask you to look at the photos of Mr. Summers, of myself. Uh, you'll see that I was in no condition to be interviewed by the police. You'll also see that if you were in that position, you would feel vulnerable. You'd feel taken advantage of. You see that I was restricted, I was captive, and possibly coerced. And I argued that. Aside from the pictures, gentlemen, I ask you to look at the videos. Um, if you look at uh, me at Miss Summer's house, I'm in a confused state of mind. We're going through a divorce. We don't know what's going on. Uh, I question Miss Matthewson about our conversations about uh, her pregnancy, and she recalled some things that we had talked about. Uh, this was something that uh, I want you to consider. I also want you to consider um, a very special moment in that video where I'm asking Ms. Matthewson what else she would like me to say. Um, I submit to you guys that when you're in these kind of positions, you can clearly see uh, through the uh, complexity of this evidence and through the variety of it, how the emotions are all over the place. I also ask you to look at the Walgreens videos. Uh, Mrs. Summers goes into, or Mr. Summers, myself, and I go into the store but that's the opposite of the state's witness. He doesn't see me go into the store. He doesn't even know where I came from. That's his testimony to you guys. He doesn't know what kind of clothes I'm wearing. He doesn't know what kind of clothes she's wearing. But this is the main witness that's supposed to uh, identify that the one single thing that he saw was her hands behind her back. He said her hands were behind her back. And I don't know how she ran out of the car. But were they tied? You have to make this decision. Again, I point to you, how do you get out of a car, your hands tied behind your back, and uh, open a door and not fall out. I also ask you to look at that Walgreens video and see that it was parked right in front of the store. If someone's held captive in the car, I don't think it's logical that you would park right in front of the store. I think you would park somewhere where no one else might see yet. I think you would uh, probably um, park in a different way so that if you needed to, you could get out quickly. But the, the testimony was that the vehicle was pulled directly in front of the store, head first into the parking spot. Um, I also ask you to consider looking at the vehicle not speeding away. There was no rush to leave there. It wasn't that much of a concern. It was a moment of panic. As you also look at the other videos, please look at the McDonald's video. Um, Mrs. Matthewson was free to leave. Uh, it was a perfect opportunity. If this is true. If, if all this weekend, uh, after 50 hours, all of these things were true, what better opportunity than there for her to be? Uh, she had the opportunity to order what she wanted. She was not being held by myself at all. Now, I know the video played with a little bit of choppiness earlier. I ask you to watch it again and, and see if you can get it to play smoothly and see that, no, this is a... Uh, agreed upon situation. We're in there together, we're getting breakfast, uh, we're moving on. Uh, I actually see that, uh, is that she is cooperative with me. Um, she's using her purse, she has the contents of that purse, and um, there's no issue that whole time, almost two minutes, of maybe even more, of going through that drive through um, Logically, I would not be able to get out of that vehicle. I had a seatbelt on, and my door would immediately hit a building. And again, a great opportunity for her to be. Um, as you look at the Sitco video, um, there are three videos on there. Two of them show me inside the store. One is from a different angle where you can see that the vehicle is not parked at the first pump. I ask you to look at that. Uh, Ms. Matthewson states that I pulled as close to the store as possible and right next to the first pump. That's not true. Uh, I didn't have any concern about where I had to pull close in proximity to the store. You can see that uh, from her vehicle where her gas tank is and where you have to pull into the gas station. It's just logic sense. Um, you can also see that um, 
I was there for inside the store for a number of minutes, and then that, again another opportunity for her to just walk away, run away. Um, I remind you guys that this is 6:50 in the morning on a Monday morning. There's people all over the place. It's rush hour. Objection, judge. Facts not in evidence. I uh, will instruct the jury again that anything that Mr. Summers or the attorneys for the state say is not evidence to rely on your own recollection as to what the evidence was in this case and testimony that came from the witness stand. I will instruct you, Mr. Summers, to avoid arguing things at this time that are not in evidence. Okay. Gentlemen, just remind you that they showed the time on the receipt of the McDonald's slip and um, that it was a Monday and it was just before 7 a.m. Um, also then ask you to consider the testimonies of the people given. Uh, the first is Randall Crosby. Again, he does not recall uh, where I came from. He does not recall what clothes I was wearing, what clothes she was wearing. Um, his statement is pretty inaccurate. He doesn't recall what vehicle it was that was 15 feet from him, even though the name and the insignia is right on the back of it. Um, only he, he was focused on was getting that license plate. He was paying attention to that, not what was happening with us. I don't understand how he could uh, be able to look at the vehicle and get the license plate at the same time pay attention to what we're doing. Um, he was also on the opposite side of the vehicle in orientation. Uh, he's standing by a red box machine. As you look through the videos, as you look at the, uh, the overall of that um, store, you'll see that uh, his position was not a very good view of our position, of Mrs. Matthewson running away, of my position um, coming out after her. He did not chase us. He did not follow us. He was also the only person standing outside at that time. You'll see a few other people walk into the store a little bit later. All of these people were also available to Ms. Matthewson to go and talk to. If I'm in the store, she could have went and talked to him or tried to seek help from him. He also in his 911 call, you can listen to that, it says that he didn't even know the street location of where he was working. Um, he didn't know that the place of his employment in his testimony, or what time he started the shift, what time he ended. Um, he was also not close enough to hear the things that were being yelled at each other. Mrs. Matthewson said that she yelled. We were screaming at each other uh, as we were going back to the car. But he couldn't hear that. I then point to you to Kimberly Shea, who gave you a very accurate uh, evaluation of what she saw. Um, her statement was true. She was pulled in directly across from the passenger side of that vehicle. She saw the emotion on Mrs. Matheson's face. Uh, she saw that we were uh, in some kind of an argument, some kind of a, uh, a, a torment. Um, and she also saw Mrs. Matheson's hand. She saw her hand leaning on the uh, door sill and leaning up against her face. Uh, that wouldn't indicate that her hands were tied at all. Um, I also point you to uh, Ms. Shea's knowledge of the exact type of vehicle it was from the moment that she saw it, uh, color, uh, the position, um, how far f she was exactly from the vehicle, um, and that we left. Then we go to David Chesla, Dr. Chesla. Dr. Tesla did not operate on me as he stated. He also doesn't remember even seeing me. Uh, he could not tell exactly what time and what type of medications were given to me. He's only assuming from some records that he may or may not have been involved with. Um, he doesn't know what the volume of the doses were or what types of uh, medications uh, could have had. He didn't testify to what kind of impact those combinations of medicines could have had. He did not speak with law enforcement, and uh, his responses were quite big. Then to the other medical professionals that testified, um, Teresa Wagner, Rita Hall, and Francesca O'Neill. They were all involved in some kind of uh, DNA analysis or some kind of um, uh, evaluation of um, Mrs. Matthewson's uh, injuries and uh, the uh, sexual battery kit. And Again, that sexual battery kit, the test came back, no evidence of rape pointing to me, no DNA match to me. Um, and this happened immediately after the alleged sexual encounters. This didn't happen after 
Ms. Matthews and Shower. Her, her allegation is that this happened on Sunday, and this test happened, and the rape test was given to her on Monday. Um, it also, uh, they also tested uh, the clothing from uh, Mrs. Matthewson, and um, none of that tested positive for myself being in contact sexually with Ms. Matthewson. Uh, the sheet from the bed tested positive for my DNA, which the um, analyst said could have been there that day or sometime prior to that. Um, as you do know, from Ms. Matthewson's testimony, we were in contact uh, prior to the 13th, uh, the 11th of uh, March. I also ask you to consider the testimonies given by law enforcement. Um, they were not a witness to anything prior to a simple peaceful arrest. I did not resist. I did not see, uh, not have any testimony of me causing any problems or acting in any kind of irrational <laughs> way with them when I was arrested. Uh, they did not attempt to investigate, despite all of this available DNA, fingerprint analysis, things that could have corroborated the story, maybe made it a lot more sense for you. But they did not attempt to test the pillows to say, yes, this is uh, evidence of her accusation. They did not attempt to test the Christmas lights to see if there's any uh, trace, as um, the fingerprint uh, expert testified to this, to see if there's anything on the glass bulbs or any kind of uh, skin, uh, any kind of anything with these Christmas lights. Um, they did not attempt to test all of those items in the vehicle. I asked Mr. Becker, could this have been tested? Could this have been tested? And it was their position that, yes, it could have been tested. And if you think about it, think about all the things, when you look through those pictures, look at all the things that were in those vehicles and, and line them up with Mrs. Matthewson's testimony and see, would those things have some value? I believe you would find that to be true. I also believe that um, the contents in the trash can, the, the rope, they collected it, but it was not tested to see if there were any, uh, any kind of skin uh, or DNA evidence on that rope. That probably would have been a, a good thing to do. Uh, they did not check the uh, NyQuil bottle, the other bottles, uh, the broken wine glass. Look at all these things. They did not check to see if any of those produced any kind of uh, evidence that would corroborate the allegations against me. So you have to ask yourself, is that reasonable? Is that fair? They also did not check anything about this uh, statement that they collected from me in a hospital that um, was taken after, again, you know that uh, high doses of medication was given to me. They did not check to see if there were boat charters on any kind of schedule or any kind of uh, thing that could have even corroborated my story there. Uh, they did not check to see if I had offshore accounts. They did not check to see if uh, any of these directions that I'm giving. If you listen to that interview, I'm talking about uh, this road and that road. I don't know. Maybe you guys are familiar with the area. Maybe you know. Objection, uh, Judge. Go I on. will uh, instruct... Uh, Mr. Trevor, not to place the jury in <coughs> your shoes or the shoes of any party. Don't make arguments like that where you to the jury. Okay. You can argue and you can argue the facts, okay. but avoid what you just did. Um, gentlemen, I would just uh, assert that the law enforcement did not check to see if these directions even fit to a map. Um, and they also didn't seem to think that the statement about immigrants was a little bit out of whack. Um, I encourage you to listen to that video, to that uh, video or that audio of this interview and, and see if uh, someone really does sound like they make sense or if they sound like uh, something different, in fear, in panic, concerned. Look at the condition that I'm in, look at the medication given, and um, please draw a conclusion from that. Um, I also submit to you that law enforcement failed to recognize any red flags or false statements um, regarding if I owned a house and if I was able to uh, just sign it over to somebody. If I owned a car and just able to sign it some over to somebody. Or even if the passwords to the bank accounts were valid or not. Uh, these all would have been 
uh, important for you to make a decision about whether or not I, I was um, giving correct information. Uh, the police also did, purposely did not interview me when I was awake, <coughs> sober, clear-headed, recovered. They only interviewed me one time at a hospital where I was vulnerable. That's it. There's no other time. They didn't come and ask me later uh, if I could please explain things better to them. They didn't come with a written statement and ask me to sign it. Uh, they didn't try to attempt to get any other information from me. They thought, case closed, he said what he said, and that's it. I also submit to you that the law enforcement uh, made no attempt to follow up on the, uh, the marks on either side of Mrs. Matthewson's neck. Uh, again, they took uh, some basic statements and said, oh, you know, it's been a long weekend. We're just going to uh, conclude here. Um, law enforcement also uh, could have taken more items into evidence to fill the holes in the story and to corroborate this story. And I believe that would have been much more helpful for you uh, to make a decision in this matter. And then we turn to the children. They only said a few things. I didn't ask them much. Um, I didn't believe they even uh, said uh, too much of value, but the little bit that they did said, it contradicted uh, their mother being dragged down a hall in the house. It contradicted uh, what their mother said about being restrained in the corner of the living room. It also um, shows that mother had no interest in speaking to them when uh, the oldest Arden came into the home, while the youngest two were into there. Um, there was no information given to them. There was no concern uh, to them about um, <coughs> while Mrs. Matthews and I are arguing and fighting in the home. And then we turn to the statements of Mrs. Matthews. These statements were outrageous. The statements were exaggerated. The statements were, most of them, impossible. Um, the responses to simple questions were abrupt and over the top. Uh, the calm answers, if you recall, they revealed some truths, such as wrestling in the living room. That's a true statement. Such as sleeping in the car. That's true. Such as not caring about sex. That's true, too. Such as just calling it sex. That's true. About being woken up by water droplets rather than some other crazy way. If you guys remember the timeline that was presented, they say that I came to her house at 12.30 in the morning, and she finally woke up around 3. A text message showed between me and my children, and I'm trying to wake her up. It showed that I tried to turn on the television, loud, I tried to put lights on and off, tried to slam some doors. I think you guys can understand that. Um, I also ask you to pay attention to the statements that Ms. Matthewson made. Uh, she drove to my neighborhood after these prior allegations. She said nothing to her children to help her in this alleged situation. She was already in the bedroom and she made no statement of being drugged back into there. She claims an entire bundle of rope fit in my jeans pocket. That rope, uh, again, was not tested to see if uh, used in any allegations here. She claims that there was a sock in her mouth, but does not recall those details. And as you go through the evidence, you'll see that no sock was recovered. You'll see that no sock was tested to corroborate this claim. She claims that duct tape was on the mouth, but again, nothing corroborates this. You have a picture of duct tape. You have a very simple thing that law enforcement could have tested and said, yeah, what she said is true. Press duct tape. You also have um, a statement about predominantly calling it sex, uh, and then has a cigarette after each time. She offers no details like in the other accusations. We just had sex, and we move on. She also says that she was screaming when she came back to the vehicle at Walgreens. And again, no witness made this kind of observation. She says that she opened her car door with her back to it 
and did not tumble out on the ground. She says that she refuses to recall the majority of the time we were together over the weekend. If you recall, we were together roughly 30 hours parked in the country, in the woods. Um, but she can't remember most of the conversations that we had. She also says that we are driving around in Monday morning, uh, on Monday morning, between the hours of 6 a.m. and 10 a.m. on some very busy roads. But she made no effort to single another car or um, really elaborate on any of uh, that time for you. Um, she also states that we argued throughout the weekend. And um, that should truly help you understanding uh, the range of emotions that were happening, the things that were happening in a uh, divorce situation. Objection, Judge. Facts, not in evidence. Again, I'll instruct the jury to rely on their own recollection of the facts where I'll caution Mr. Summers to please avoid arguing or referring to any facts that were not testified to in this case. Yes, um, and then we'll go to my interview. Um, if you evaluate me on this statement made in the hospital, um, I hope you find that it doesn't make much sense. I hope you find that there are a glaring number of issues, sometimes in, sometimes out. Um, things about, again, bolts and uh, incongruent driving directions, uh, about immigrants, about a variety of things that um, really show uh, a concern for the situation I'm in. So please evaluate that based on the conditions that you know surround uh, that um, interview. Um, aside from this, gentlemen, I just remind you that from the beginning, I, I've assumed my presumption of in innocence, and um, and I maintain this until now. Uh, I assert that the state has not proven what was in my heart, especially regarding two counts. Of Objection, the judge. Inappropriate uh, requirement of the state to prove what's in its heart. I'll, I'll instruct the jury that what Mr. Summers say is certainly not the law in this case. The law will come from me and the elements of the crimes will be contained in that law. Mr. Summers, uh, restrict your argument to the law and the evidence in this case, please. Yes, sir. Um, I'll rephrase that, gentlemen. The state has not proved my intentions. Um, they have not proved that I intended and in counts one and two uh, to kill Mrs. Matthews. In my statement uh, in the hospital interview, I clearly never said I intended to hurt her. If you're relying on that, that's fine. I never said I intended to kill her with uh, a pillow. And I never said anything about the rope. Never mentioned the incident one bit. Um, I'm also going to uh, assert that they did not show any intent to steal a car. They did not show that that was the underlying reason that Mrs. Matthewson went with me. They did not show the, that I intended to kidnap her. Uh, there's a lot of holes in their story, and I ask you to please consider that when evaluating whether or not you find the, uh, the facts true. They also uh, did not show my intent to take advantage of Mrs. Matthewson in any sexual way. Uh, You've heard the way I've described it in my interview. You've heard the way she's described it. And um, I hope you can appreciate that. I also uh, believe that you would find that they did not prove that I intended to steal a car, which is one of the uh, later charges on this long list that they've put together. Um, I believe you would find that it is a civil matter uh, and that uh, when two people are married, they commonly use each other's vehicles, even if they are separate. Objection, Judge. Improper argument. Again, I'll instruct uh, Mr. Summers to limit your argument to the facts and the law that are applicable to this case. Gentlemen, I assert that um, utilizing cars while married is a civil matter. 
I also um, uh, don't argue other issues. Um, I ask you to uh, just be favorable in understanding uh, my position here. I ask you to please um, uh, be cautious in understanding um, what burden of proof the state has to provide and how high that threshold is, that you cannot have doubts about these allegations. Uh, they are very serious. Objection, judge, misstatement of the law. I will instruct the jury that, again, what Mr. Summers says is not the law. You will hear the definition of reasonable doubt when I uh, instruct you on that law. And so, gentlemen, um, reasonable doubt, I believe, is everywhere. And I ask you uh, to please remember that and to please focus on that, uh, that element that has to be proven by the time that you make these decisions about my life, about uh, the situation uh, that uh, you've been presented, uh, about deciding whether or not to find me innocent or guilty. I ask you to please consider all of these factors and see that what I am trying to um, show you is that um, this was a very abnormal series of events, and it requires a lot more information for you to uh, draw a conclusion that would say that I absolutely am guilty of these crimes. And so for all of these reasons, gentlemen, I thank you for your time. I thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to explain this to you and to share with you um, a, a better understanding of putting it together. I thank you for allowing me to paint a little bit better of a picture, and I do appreciate your time, and uh, I value uh, your opinion on this. And I do ask you to please uh, find me innocent of uh, the charges against me and um, to consider what else uh, may be available to you as you are instructed by the judge. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Ms. Johnson, rebuttal from the state? Yes, 